Part 1 I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I understand that you all own your own home, and some of you may be interested in buying additional property here in the city, so I hope you will find the information I am going to share with you useful and informative. I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. The city centre of any area is obviously going to have the highest prices, and as more and more people are competing for houses in this area, both renting and buying are becoming increasingly difficult. It is most people's dream to one day own their own house. House ownership gives us a feeling of having achieved something, and we can see clearly what we have worked so hard for all our lives. It can give us a sense of security for our old age, and a knowledge that we will hopefully have something to pass on to our children. However, buying a house, particularly for first-time buyers, is becoming more and more difficult, not only due to increasing prices, but also because of the need for a substantial deposit. For younger people, buying their first home is very difficult and often impossible. Young couples who cannot get the deposit together need to rent for a long time and sometimes forever. While traditionally, homes near the centre of the city have been the most desirable, people are now looking further afield. This has happened for a number of reasons, the main one being that our style of work is changing, along with that of other countries such as the USA. In certain professions, for example sales and computing, it is no longer necessary for people to be based in an office full-time. More and more people are beginning to work from home, which means they can avoid the hustle and bustle of rush hour traffic jams into work, and have more freedom to choose to live in a more rural and peaceful location. My company deals with finding property for both purchasers and renters in the city area. One of my main roles within the company is to find investment properties for people who wish to plan ahead for their future. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. An investment property is usually at the cheaper end of the market. People buy investment properties not to live in, but in addition to their own home in order to rent it out to other people. The advantage of putting your savings into property for the future is that you can be pretty certain that, as a long-term investment, your money will safely increase in value in line with inflation. Many people are turning to property investment instead of pension schemes, as we hear the horror stories of countries such as the UK, where people have invested all their lives into their pension schemes to find that now their money is relatively worthless. Houses automatically earn what is known as capital gains. That is, for every year you own the property, it becomes more valuable and often gives a better rate of interest on your money than most banks do. However, that is not to say there are no risks. There are people who buy property when the market is high and prices are inflated beyond their true value, only to find that when the housing market slows down, they are in a state of negative equity. Negative equity is a situation that arises when you owe more for the house than the house itself is worth. In short, the best advice is to be aware of the ups and downs of the housing market. Property investment, if handled correctly, can be enormously satisfying. I hope that this has given you an insight into the basics of the property market. Thank you for listening. Please raise your hand if you have any questions and I will try to be of assistance. That is the end of part one. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So, a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. 
In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Alex, asking his tutor for advice about essay writing. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 27. Hi, Alex. Come in. I gather you wanted some help with writing essays. Yes. I'm finding this first term difficult, and I'm worried about the assignments we have to do for January. Well, let me see if I can help. You shouldn't panic about it, because essay writing is a very straightforward process, really. What it involves is organising the information that you want to include. You shouldn't have more than you can easily manage within the word count. Make sure you haven't got too much or anything irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look at that and work out what you need and what you don't need before you start. And then you just have to think about how you're going to put forward your argument. Oh, that sounds very straightforward when you put it like that. <laughs> but I'm worried I haven't got the necessary skills for writing an effective essay because English is my second language. Mm. Well, perhaps you misunderstand the skills you need. You need to be able to analyse your data and then I would say the skills of interpretation and expressing yourself are important. Perhaps it's this last one that bothers you, but the more essays you write, the more you will develop these skills. Yes, and I don't quite know how to improve at that. Though, as you say, I know practice will help. Mm. And I need to make sure I've got everything ready before I start. Yes. What is vital to good essay writing is preparation, so make sure you build in enough time to do the research you need. Are there any other sources I can use to help me with essays? Yes. You should go to the library and look through the reference section, because there are books that focus on the style we use in academic writing 
and those will help you a lot. The other thing that you should think about is what happens when you've actually written your essay. Too many students just complete their work and hand it in, whereas what you should be doing is making sure that you edit it as thoroughly as possible. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Then I'd pick up any mistakes and also see if it reads logically. Exactly. Uh, the other thing is, again, what a lot of students do is get their essays back, look at the marks, then just file it away. Hmm. They don't realise that if they checked it through and looked at what the tutor had written, then they can learn from their old essays. Yeah, I can see that's a good idea. So, is that OK? You can always come back to me. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 28 to 30. Actually, uh, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about essay writing. Uh -huh. I had had a few thoughts of my own about what I should do, such as really taking good notes when I'm reading, because that helps, doesn't it? Mm, I think it improves your knowledge rather than your actual writing. Uh, but one tip I can give you is to try and not read too much. Otherwise, you end up including irrelevant material in your essay. Remember to stay on task. Yes. Sometimes I have problems interpreting the questions correctly. Or the whole question seems overwhelming to me. Mm. What I try to do is highlight the key parts and divide it into smaller chunks so I can manage it. Well, you might find it useful to break it down even further by making sure you understand all the words perfectly before you start. Things like assess or comment and such like. Yes, I see. Sometimes, after an objective analysis, the question actually asks you for a subjective opinion. But you must remember to support your arguments, if that's the case. Mm. Um, one final comment I can make is about using your own words. You must try to do this as far as possible. You're expected to summarise what you've read, not just string together a list of quotations. In fact, you shouldn't have too many. Just use them where it's really important. OK, thanks. Do you read other students' essays when you've finished? No. Why? Is that a good idea? Well, you can confuse each other, so I'd advise against it. But it's up to you. OK. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Black Bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35 on page 126. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. 
The black bear, or Ursus americanus, has a wide range inhabiting forested areas of North America, including Canada, the United States, and parts of northern Mexico. Black bears are omnivores, getting their nutrition from a wide variety of plants and animals. The particular foods any one bear eats depends on what's available in the area where that bear lives, as well as on the season of the year. Generally speaking, plant foods make up 90% of the bear's diet. The rest of its meals consist of animal foods, such as insects and fish. Bears have a relatively long gestation period. Mating takes place in the spring or early summer, but bear cubs aren't born until the following winter. Usually, two cubs are born at a time, although some litters may have as many as five cubs. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother and may stay with her for close to two years. Wild black bears can live as long as 25 years. They've lived for as long as 30 years or more in captivity. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Much of the black bear's range coincides with the range of its close cousin, the grizzly bear. Although these bears are somewhat similar in appearance and habits, it isn't difficult to tell the difference between them. Colour isn't necessarily a distinguishing characteristic, as both species of bears occur in a range of colours from almost blonde to dark brown or black. Many black bears, however, have a patch of fur on their chests that's lighter in colour than the rest of their fur. Grizzly bears don't have this patch. Size isn't always a distinguishing feature either, although grizzly bears are usually heavier with an average weight of 225 kilos. Black bears average 140 kilos in weight. Grizzly bears spend time digging in the ground for roots and tubers that make up part of their diet. The large muscles they need for this give them a distinct shoulder hump. This hump is absent in black bears, which don't do the same kind of digging. The shape of the face and ears is also different in each species of bear. Grizzly bears have a depression between the eyes and nose and short round ears. Black bears, on the other hand, have a straighter profile and longer, more pointed ears. Grizzly bears are known for their fearsome, long, sharp claws. Black bears have shorter claws, which are better suited for climbing trees. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test.